Hey, it's Logan Christopher from Lost Empire Herbs, and I have some exciting news for you. The first ever human trial of pine pollen use, uh, looking at testosterone has now been published. Uh, we were put in a position where we were able to fund this study and make it happen. So there's been no pine pollen studies on humans. And even though pine pollen is well known for helping with the hormones, none of the research is really looking at that. There's very limited uh, there's some cell research and some animal research. So as far as I know, this is the first ever human study and definitely the first ever one looking at this. Now it's a pilot trial, so it's small, like only 10 subjects were involved and no placebo control, no uh, double blind, um, but that is kind of what you need to do. And just the price tag on doing this was quite expensive. Um, and we have countless evidence of pine pollen working, so we know it works already. But to kind of get this further into the mainstream, to put some science behind it, uh, to have that validation in that way was an important step. So we're happy to actually do that. And in this video, I'm going to walk you through the study, just literally going to read over it, highlight the important points and show you everything, including the, the limitations like this wasn't a perfect study in many ways. Uh, so I have it pulled up here. And of course, you'll find the link around this video if you want to do it. It's not particularly long, nine pages uh, and the last two pages are references. So this study was looking at men between the ages of 47 and 78 years old. So really the older male demographic uh, where androgen deficiency tends to increase with age. Uh, then with these subjects, um, they're looking at blood testosterone levels, just specifically total testosterone. We would like to look at all kinds of different factors, estrogen, uh, free T, sex hormone binding globulin. However, every uh, component of that would have added cost to the study. So just doing this pilot study here, uh, we started really simply looking at this. And I'll go into some of the details of what happened before mentioning that. So they specifically used our pine pollen tincture, just using this in the standard way we recommend it, which is uh, morning and uh, night taking a one milliliter dropper of this and doing that for five days on, two days off. So our standard dosage, our standard cycling is exactly what these men did over the course of eight weeks. And what they had was uh, total testosterone levels increased from 362.5 on average to 448.4 nanograms per deciliter. Uh, if we scroll down here, so here's the results. This was the, the mean where they started and where they ended and each subject. So uh, there was initially 12 subjects, but two got screened out for medical reasons. So that left 10 subjects in there. Uh, the men started from a range of 209, which is pretty low, kind of depends on the reference range, uh, what people are talking about, but somewhere in like middle range, which this is considered good testosterone just because we have a uh, wide range, but really ideal levels you want to see above 700. And then the changes were over here. And so we saw one person get there. And this this one was the outlier of the bunch. Um, either this was just like the perfect herb for this person, or maybe some other things were going on. And that definitely skews the average increase of 85 points. But even if we throw this one out as an outlier, which they didn't do here, um, but if that was done, it would still have like a 48 point increase was what I calculated. So we see some other decent raises in here. One person did have a null result, just 316 before and after. A couple of people here had very minimal results, but other people, you know, this was just eight weeks without changing much, much else, just using the pine pollen tincture. So that is uh, the results they got there. Now, these were not statistically significant. It was trending positive. Um, typically the p-value that people are looking for is 0 0.05, which means a one in 20% chance that this is just random, that it's chance that it happened. So this was just above it. So it didn't reach the uh, typical statistical significance. And this was in part with just the large range and then the small subject manners, uh, the small number of subjects. That's why it didn't quite reach that, but it was trending in their, that direction. So uh, just by the fact that everyone had positive results, except for that one person was pretty significant. Next up is this. So they used the Q Adam survey, which is described in here. Um, this is a survey that is used by uh, various health practitioners, such as a uh, urologist, and it's looking at um, these questions which give an idea of androgen sufficiency, 
but just really, I mean, look at this, what's your enjoyment of life and your happiness level? Um, so it's looking at a wide range of things, sexual health, erection, sex drive, energy level, strength and endurance, sports ability, falling asleep after dinner. So it's, it's kind of a wide range of questions. And ultimately, this is, to me, the more important part of the study. Yeah, we like to look at the numbers of the testosterone. But here we see that, okay, so we, on each of these questions, or let me back up here, uh, you're going to rate it from uh, one to five, terrible to excellent. And they did this at the beginning when they did the initial blood test. And then after eight weeks of supplementation, did the blood test again and answered the, the survey again. So the mean score, the average was 23.9, which is below average. And it increased to 31.7, so a 7.8 uh, score increase. And this was over the eight weeks. And this took them from below average to above average. And here we see um, not so much outliers here because we had two people at 14, uh, one person at 13 here. The lowest increase was a one followed by a three. Uh, but again, or in this case, everyone had positive results. There was no no results in this one. And more important, uh, statistical significance was high at 0 0.0035. So this comes out to something like one in a 280 uh, chance of being random. Um, so quite a bit significant. So even just having 10 subjects, this was very, very highly significant that this happened. And to me, this is more important because uh, who honestly really cares, except that we know it's good for us to have the these numbers uh, for our testosterone. What we really want is good scores to these questions that we have, right? I mean, do you care if your testosterone was showing up as 500 or 900? Uh, not so much compared to is your libido average or is it excellent? Is your strength average or is it excellent? That sort of thing. So this is uh, really important stuff that came from it. And again, this isn't surprising to us because we have all this anecdotal evidence from thousands of happy customers. Uh, but, but to see the numbers done in a scientific form like this, this is really important. So of course there was limitations to this trial. It had only 10 subjects. It was not placebo controlled. It was not double blind. Um, there's things that could be done to improve it. I mean, if we took out that person, that one kind of outlier there, which Again, like I really want to know <laughs> how how that significant of an increase happened for that person. I would definitely say it's possible, but from borderline low testosterone to actually in that ideal range is uh, really fascinating if that indeed was the, the case without other changes. Um, so, of course, this will be followed up with more research. We're looking at doing the, the next study, which may involve younger people. We'd love to do uh, women at some point and just really continue to build off of this. Uh, if you have any questions on this or want some more detail, again, you can look at the study yourself and read into it. It's not perfect. Uh, I'll say just by the fact that we funded the study, like we wanted to get positive results. The researchers that we worked with uh, wanted to get positive results just because, you know, you don't want to get like a negative <laughs> result when you're uh, researching. Um, but I wasn't actually involved besides you know, spitballing the ideas of what we'd like to see. So I was kind of involved in the initial study, but didn't actually, I didn't talk to the subjects. I wasn't involved. None, no one on the Lost Empire Herbs team was involved. Uh, I didn't even get to see the, the, um, this study before it went to publishing. And actually I had an error in there. This kind of proves it, if I can remember where this was. Uh, yeah, this, and to me, this is kind of a big error, but this is the fact I didn't even get to proofread this. Um, where is it? Yeah, one mechanism presumed responsible for clinical outcome is the presence of phytoestrogens. Um, it should say phytoandrogens. Um, so that they actually made kind of a big mistake in there. Um, and they also say they put my home address instead of the company, which is based out of Kansas City, Missouri. So that just goes to prove that I, I did not actually write this report because I would not have made those mistakes and I would have uh, told them so I gave them details on the uh, what's in the tincture um, how that is made so that's all there so again if you have any questions I'm really excited about this I hope this helps pine pollen to get to a wider audience out there and to be able to kind of spread the fact that this is helping a lot of people and will continue to do so 
Uh, we definitely have a lot more information available at Lost Empire Herbs. So head on over there. I'll have an article kind of giving this breakdown in addition to this video. And you can find a lot more on, the, of course, pine pollen, but also the many other herbs we have available too.